then mostly. How was it that he started? I mean, obviously he was sort of a creature of habit, right? He was went to the New York Ballet. Fifteen years. Yeah. So Every he performance. Sort of he liked to get into somewhat of a routine, but how yeah. did he start coming here to Jackson? I mean, he had already know, known you yeah, before, yeah, then, right? Yeah, and uh, he, uh, we used to joke a lot, and uh, and he'd write that, and it was kind of offensive joking. It was, what's the matter? Is, are we off? No, I'm just uh, adjusting. Oh. But we're still going. Oh. So he, uh, we developed a, a kind of a camaraderie, and and, uh, and that helped overall for, to loosen him up a little. And then he he got so that the the camaraderie spread to other people, and then he began uh, joking and insulting and intimidating other people, and uh, so that's how and why he came here. He lived down the street. He was. It was easier for him to buy his breakfast and and uh, lunch than to cook it because he would he would he, he would get a truck that would deliver boxes of books from the Gotham bookstore, and he would sign every single one of them, and they were hundreds of books, and that would stagger my imagination that a man would have the patience to sign his name to all of these books, so he didn't have a lot of time. He was a workaholic. He was like Herbert. Herbert's a workaholic. Herbert sent. He's a workaholic. They never, so little time, so much to do. God, if I've heard that once, I've heard it a thousand times. And uh, so that's that's just. He came here and he uh, he liked the atmosphere and the food and he was lazy, so that it was just a short trip from the house. He never walked. He always drove. And. Uh, Initially, he used to wear that those fur coats, and then the animal welfare people kind of intimidated him, and so he didn't wear those anymore. <laughs> but he left in his will; he left everything that he had, his estate, his future uh, income, to uh, the animal welfare people, the the, the Brewster cat people, uh, the bat people in Texas. Uh, some other thing in any any or any worthwhile organization, and it's interesting because the people that bought his house are animal welfare people. Uh, it's I don't understand that. It's a a foundation, and they have a, a considerable amount of money, and they uh, they do a lot uh, with uh, private Catholic schools on founding and. Uh, uh, financing and whatnot. So this is kind of a, a different thing for them because one of them is a, a very successful veterinarian, and he's interested in, of course, animal welfare. And so they've they've bought this house and they want to convert it into uh, an Edward Gorey Museum, and uh, which would be ideal because you've got the. Uh, the New Jerusalem Church there. You've got the two ancient houses. You've got the uh, uh, historic society right across the street. So that there are five existing museum-type organizations already, and this would be a nice addition. And there's enough room for the parking because Edward was not that. The people are not going to throng to see Edward's work or his home or whatnot. But he has a dedicated following that will certainly support. Something of that nature, and in a, and in addition to that, of course, you've got the other facilities around, so that it would be a, a nice afternoon to come and visit his place and visit the historic society and the the New Jerusalem Church and stuff like that. So that's great for the for the uh, for the neighborhood, and Edward gave a lot to the community without asking for anything, and and he'll be he'll be sorely missed because of the. The depth of his giving, that was uh, no one knew about. You know, not, he he never publicized or anything of that nature. That so that uh, I think that I hope that it works out as well as uh, it should because he was someone that should be remembered because he internationally, so far as uh, his writings and his style, there's no one else like him and. and 
never has been to that degree. Tell me about the, uh, you know, you're, you're familiar with his work and also with his life. Do you th see those two things going together? I mean, when you read his work, are you ever struck by, I can't believe this is, I don't know, I mean, no. do you see a connection? No, I don't. He used to carry a little black book and a pencil. And every now and then he'd stop whatever he was doing and he'd write it in the book, which was an idea. He had an idea for hundreds of more uh, books or, or plays, and he loved the local plays. That was such a joy to the artistic community of, of Cape Cod to have him do his little plays from, from Woods Hole up to Provincetown. And he had a, a small but steady following. And the, the people that are engaged in his, his uh, cast uh, were accustomed to, every, to half the audience leaving at the intermission because they didn't know what was going on. But the actors and actresses accepted it. It's Edward Gorey, you know. People don't always, they're going to go with great anticipation. And, this, and they go outside and they say, what was that? And the other would pray, I have no idea. <laughs> Let's go have a drink. Good idea. <laughs> because he was, but he didn't care. He was happy. He was never happier than he used to sit in the theater and he'd kill himself laughing at his own lines. And he had a, a booming laugh. And it was such a joy to sit there and, and just see the, the action going on and, and the, the, the great lines and the duds, because the duds were just as funny as his more productive stuff. So that it was, it was great. And then afterward, we'd go out to dinner somewhere, but wherever he was, you know, his local thing was. He's a beauty. Did, um, he seemed to have really taken, he seemed to like to do things, you know, in a grassroots way. Like he really. He wasn't he pretentious. He didn't like to go no. the Hollywood way. No, you know? he, he told me years ago he said, what he likes is just plain folks. That's what he really liked. Uh, I have a, a friend who has uh, an enormous amount of wealth. And uh, he liked Edward, but Edward wanted nothing to do with him because he was so wealthy. And so he, he just shut him time and time again. Uh, Jack would try to make, you know, small talk and Edward wouldn't participate. So Jack said, well, he doesn't like me. And I said, well, he doesn't like what you've got. <laughs> so he was, uh, in, so in that sense, he was very selective. But so far as uh, uh, if you had a sense of humor, that's all it took. That, then you were golden because he liked that. Tell me about a sense of humor. Uh, did, did you guys share that sense of humor? Oh, yeah. yeah. That's all we had going for one another, is our senses of humor. And, and our like for bric-a-brac, uh, you know, collections. And he's a bibliophile, and I'm a bibliophile, but he uh, has a, had a hell of a lot more money to buy books with than, than I do. And, and uh, music, he had terrible taste in music. Unbelievably bad taste in music. Well, for me, I'm a romanticist, so I love Tchaikovsky and Prokofiev and Rachmaninoff. He had very few in all of the, I don't know how many thousands of uh, CDs he had on the walls in there. Uh, I, he might have had uh, 10 of those that were romantic composers, uh, Tchaikovsky, uh, Rachmaninoff, that I didn't like. And, uh, but he had such obscure musicians and obscure orchestras and, and uh, what was the question? <laughs> uh, it was about a sense of humor, I guess, but I was actually interested in what you're talking about. Is, as far as classical music goes, wh who were his favorites, do you think? Oh, he was deep. I mean, he seemed to like a lot of just like bare piano. Like I well, he, he, he liked, he, he was eclectic, he liked everything. Classical, he was into uh, Mozart and, uh, and Berlioz, Beethoven, uh, Bach, uh, Bach, and he would buy, go into a store, he already had Bach, 
he'd buy another complete collection of Bach and stick that in there. Never opened it. Still, it was there to the day he went. Never opened it. He already had it. But he was. That's one of the things that he and Herbert had in common. And they would talk with total knowledge about such obscure composers that I can't even think of the names it, 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 in one ear and out the other, in a matter of total indifference. But the two of them were attuned to that, and they knew all of these really weird composers and their music. And every now and then they played some. And if that didn't put you to sleep like that, nothing would. But that just goes to show you that my level is a little low. And, uh, but, you know, there are people that are realists and there are people that are romanticists. And, but, but Edward and I, uh, we had such a, a, a joyful association that, and as I say, no one influenced anyone else and no one interfered in anyone's life. And we accepted one another as interesting human beings, period. And although one time I thought that Edward was having a little financial problem, and I'm always strapped, but at this one particular time I had a little extra money, and uh, so I, I kind of awkwardly said that I, if, you know, if he needed it, I, I would let him have it. And uh, no, 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 I, I'm all right, I'm all right. And then he mentioned that to Rick Jones, which astounded me because I thought it was kind of a privileged communication. <laughs> but then a month later, the, the money that I had was gone, so it didn't make any difference. But uh, he was uh, he was so genuine. He just, you know, you can't describe it. You have to. He was intimidating at first, and he looked like Santa Claus. And the kids used to go up to him because he looked like Santa Claus, tall but not rotund. And I told you about Heather, that, that uh, my daughter Heather was an artist and she, uh, she and he were friends. And, uh, and they did a lot of artistic talking and exchanging of ideas and paints and solutions and drying processes and whatnot. And uh, Edward, of course, had that, that great gray beard and daughter would come into the restaurant and she, she called him sweetheart and sweetheart and she'd grab him by the beard and shake his head and i said oh that must be painful so i told heather i said heather i don't think that's proper that you should grab him by the beard and whatnot and she said oh and then i said edward i got him later and i said i'd, I'd like to apologize for for heather you know, grabbing you in that fit. Oh, that's all right. That's how she is. So that he was, you know, whew. If I had a beard and some kid dead, I'd, they'd be smoked halfway across the room. <laughs> what, uh, how did he deal with, I mean, he must have had just every day. I mean, I can't imagine every meal that someone must have, you know, people knew to come in and look for Very, him. very seldom. We have kind of a policy because we we get uh, through Helen and Herbert or the Playhouse or just accidental we get people of uh, uh, theatrical notoriety that come in and and our policy is to leave them alone just treat them. Dinah Shore came in one time ate like a horse I couldn't believe how much that woman ate and then she went in the bathroom and threw it up and uh, I said. Whoa, you know, but no one bothered her while, while she was here. And Betsy Palmer and others, a whole stack of them. So that people uh, respected his privacy. Not only that, but when you've got your face in a book like this, it's difficult to penetrate or get eye contact or whatever you, you know, you want to do. But later on, uh, people would go up and ask him for his autograph or whatnot. And he'd be delighted to, he'd sign it and, and uh, a little casual conversation and they'd leave, which was great. One day, I was at the cash register. Edward had just finished ringing up his sale, putting his money in and throwing the tip in the bowl where his thing is. 
and three young girls came up to him and asked for his autograph. And they said, oh, you know, we if, thank you, Mr. Gore, if you could. And much, much he, so he's signing it. So I reached in my pocket and I took out a check. And we both had the same bank, Bank of Boston. And I folded it in half. And uh, he signed those. I said, well, I'd like your autograph too, Mr. Gorey. And I passed it to him. And, uh, and he wrote and gave it back to me. And when I looked at it, he'd written, up yours. <laughs> I still have the check. <laughs> and I had that, I had that photographed and, and uh, put into, uh, because that was so beautiful. And that was him. That's how, he was just, he was just a, absolute joy and a delight. And what a shame that there aren't more people like that. Yeah, I can't think of anything. I was always struck by, you know, you read those articles where it says Edward Gorey, you know, master of the macabre. And, you know, he's got this mystique with being this kind of a dark, gothic, you know, man. And in, in person, he's not like that no. at all. No, no. Can you tell me a little bit about that difference? I mean, he definitely has, you can see where the taste, his sense of his style and his taste comes from. I mean, it... it he, and the vocabulary. You can see that. But what as a far vocabulary. As Paul, like you said, he was just, um, you know, actually, tell, can you tell me about that frog? He ha seemed to have, every time you leave, he always seemed to be looking for frogs. And so, but I was oh. interested in you said he was... He was he gave, intimidated he gave, by that whole frog scenario, and you wouldn't think someone who'd written the books he wrote Oh, he wrote would be shocked by anything. Yeah, dozens and dozens of frogs. I've got a couple of them. I don't know where they are, but I. Uh, not that I can't find anything. If I want to find them, I don't want to get up because. Uh, he. Uh, he knitted me a little, yellow, sunshine yellow baby sock. And in the sock, he put a, one of his rocks. And then he, he made a little notation that went with it. And uh, I think it was if I wished hard enough and talked to it, it would turn into a frog. And uh, it's over at the, uh, they're having his uh, Dracula show at the Cape Playhouse, it starts this Monday. And I loaned them some stuff, and that was one of the things I loaned them. And that, that, uh, and then I had a copy of his he, uh, the unstrung harp, which was, I think fifty nine or fifty eight, and uh, and he autographed that book to me, uh, as uh, this my first book, so I let them take that. And I think it's it's great that he, he did, uh, a lot of these things and and put to Jack on them because they, uh, it gives me warmth to read that now and, and I know that. But, and of course that totally ruins any resale value it might have because it's personalized and you know, they, but I loved it when he put my name on it. I thought it was su super. And when I was in the hospital, I excused him from coming to the hospital because he hated hospitals. So he called and uh, I talked to him and I told him that he said, "Well, I'll come over." And I said, "No." I said, "I, I, I grant you abstinence for <laughs> or whatever for, from coming over." And he appreciated that and he gave me something afterward. I can't remember what it was, but it was. Uh, it's a, a thank you for not having me <laughs> go over to the damned hospital. <laughs> you know, that's another thing. I don't think I remember him swearing. I can't remember him swearing. I had another friend like that who never swore. He was 40 years old, never swore until he took up golf. And then that man was such an embarrassment on the golf course you couldn't believe. But Edward, Edward, I don't, I don't recall him because he had such a, a forceful vocabulary that there no need for swearing. And uh, he had he had words that sang to the imagination. No idea what they meant, but 
the imagination was was uh, just beautiful. And of course, I've got some of his books, the research books, and they have all kinds of, of words and phrases and archaic things, and, and uh, it's a joy to read because then you see part of his mind where he picked all this stuff up. God, what a shame. Too bad he left us. He was going to do another. He did a puppet show here one time, and it was great. And he was going to do another one. And uh, he, you know, he left us. So that was that was the. Uh, but he was a one of a kind. It's just there's nothing like that anymore. The, the education that, that we get on television has ruined any intellectual properties that that might have abounded had we not had those. Not that I hate television. It's just garbage. So Except you for the to be able to take it in and then out would come something else, right? I mean, when he would, the way, like, well, I guess when he was watching TV, he would actually be drawing, working a oh, lot yeah. of times, right? He, you know, he worked on a piece of wood like that. That was it. That was how he, the total of his desk was a piece of work like that. Which, of course, the pen, I have one of his pens that he used. That was part of my bequeathment. That was the... Uh, Brown ink. He used brown ink, but it came out black. I don't know how he did that. But Rick Jones, we've got to talk to Rick Jones because and that cat. That cat is such a story that it it would make a great book. Remember Eloise? If the was it the Ritz or the Carlton or what the hell was in New York? Uh, or anyway, Eloise was a little girl that lived in the hotel. No, nice talking to you. <laughs> um, anyway, this cat, Edward's cat, the one that nobody ever saw, except Edward. Uh, what a what a turnaround! What an unbelievable, smart as a whip. The cat opened doors. I mean, opened doors that were shut so that he would keep the cat out. You cannot believe the thing, that the things that this cat developed. A cat, not a recluse anymore. This was a real cat out and bringing in little chipmunks and rabbits and all kinds of uh, creepy crawlies. So when you talk to Rick, ask him about that cat. Oh, what a joy. What do you give Edward's reputation as a, as a recluse? I mean, would you, as a reclusive individual, do you, would, would you say that Edward was, was reclusive or do you think that's just a reputation that he has? I don't think he was that reclusive. He was uh, selective on, on uh, like parties. He was not much of a one for parties, but he would come. If we had small little groups, uh, five, six, uh, he would come. That was great. But if you had a large, like Helen and Herbert have uh, a lot of parties because they have a party home, and uh, he he was he just preferred not to go to to places like that. But he wasn't reclusive. He was out all the time. He would, you know, he traveled all over. And talk about a nut for the Saturday sidewalk sales. What are they when they have uh, yard sales? Yard sales. It, that was it. Saturday and Sunday, he had to go to those yard sales, and that's where half of the garbage in his house came from. And things that he had, like I have a lot of his rocks. And you pick up a rock, and it's a rock. Not to Edward, to rock, that was a frog. And if you just looked at it in a certain way, there was a frog. I look at it up, down, sideways, bright light, soft light, rock. But he had uh, uh, just a joyful imagination. And some of his tools, I got some of his tools, and they were uh, formerly used by uh, shoemakers, cobblers, uh, what the hell, those people who make shoes. And uh, it looks like a uh, one of the little animals that he draws, and that's why he was attracted to them, the fig bash. And he had about ten of them. He bought them off of a guy down in Dennis. Uh, I've forgotten his name, but I happened to mention because he and Bear Riley and I had dinner one night over at the Hoosie, and I mentioned I, I got some of Edward's tools. It looked like a fig bash, and he said, "Oh." 
He says, I sold him those. He said, he bought every one I had. He said, I got two more when I was waiting for him to come in. <laughs> and if he liked something, he'd buy a whole series. If he liked one song, he'd buy everything they ever, they ever produced. And uh, didn't open them up, but he had that one song that he liked and he didn't go any further. So, what have we left out? Well, I was thinking about, you know how there are so many people, if you knew Edward, you knew that, well, a lot of people thought that he should have, he, he could easily have been more, more famous or had more yeah. mainstream or appeal. And yeah. why do you think he resisted that? As far as That's how he was. That's how yeah. he was. Yeah. He didn't go much for the hoopla. Um, matter of fact, he got a, a Tony Award and he gave it to some woman, a friend of his in New Bedford. He never kept it. She has it and she's loaning it to the, uh, the theater. It's going to be in the lobby of the theater for the next uh, two weeks for, on Edward's show. That's the Tony from Dracula? Yeah, yeah. So he wasn't uh, terribly impressed with awards and things like that. He, he was his own man. He'd led his own life. He was happy doing what he was doing. He didn't have enough time because uh, he had so many things that he, his mind just kept going and going and going. And uh, when, when he did drawings, some of the stuff that he did had thousands of little lines, you know, just time. Time, time, time. He was so great, just a joy. Sometimes he was a pain in the butt, but that's all right. That's how we are. And that's and he felt that about us. Sometimes he wouldn't get what he wanted for breakfast. Oh, Jesus, you'd hear him spout and go it back there and sputter. Oh. What sort of thing, you mentioned that he tend to eat the same thing all the time. What sort of thing would he eat for breakfast? Uh, yeah, in the morning, he had uh, Wheaties and fruit, copious quantities of fruit, and an English muffin, no butter, no butter, and uh, uh, coffee. And that was his breakfast. And lunch, usually, he had a roast beef plate when we had roast beef, or he had a fruit plate, or uh, some other kind of a plate, I've forgotten what, but with a salad like that. Iced tea, and that was that was it. I got. Matter of fact, I have a st all of those checks of his for I don't know how many, a few hundred. And what I've done is uh, gotten people that that ate breakfast at w at the same time, not with him, but at the same time that he did. And I'm putting the two together and laminating them, and I'm giving it to them as a memento of Edward and to keep keep his keep his name alive, because I think it's important that a, that a person of that enormous talent shouldn't fade away. He should, he should, you know, not Shakespeare, but he's damn close. Do you think that um, history will be good to... to Isn't that an so? interesting question? I worry about that, because he deserves to have history remember him. But he was so low-key himself, that he never did anything to perpetuate his name or his reputation. He just accepted things as they were, which is great. You sleep nights, you know, you don't, you're not worried. And, uh, and I never heard him complain about uh, usage or people that were using him or, or uh, things of that nature. He was always, or if he did, he'd do it in a jocular fashion, just kind of offhand. No. Tell me about the sign uh, on your your bowl. Oh, the tip bowl? Yeah. He did that years and years ago. Uh, cray, I can't even remember when he did that. But uh, he was impressed with the arrogance of the size of the bowl. <laughs> and I think I asked him one time, I said, you, you want to make up a little figure or something and I'll put it on the bowl? And uh, he never said yes, never said no, but then a couple of days later he brought that in, which took quite a while to do because I think six figures. Uh, and that, uh, 
the hell is it? Don't forget, kindly remember the widows and orphans, or I can't remember what the hell that is. But he did that, and that's a joy. That's a joy, and a lot of people comment on it. And you know, we get a lot of young people uh, in the in the 12 to 16 year age that I can't tell because they all look like babies, but uh, they come in. They don't buy anything. They just want to know, is this where Edward Gorey was? They don't have any money. So, and I show it to them, uh, where, the, where he sat and whatnot, and, and uh, have, have a soda and have something so, you know, so that you can remember. And they said, thank you. And then they sent back a beautiful little handwritten, hand, uh, Gorey-style uh, etching on a piece of paper. Yeah, that was so that uh, he he has a pretty broad cross section of people, and in San Francisco they love him out there, because that's a kind of a spacey shot area. But that they really love him out there, yeah. Uh, New York City, of course, but what the hell? But it's the end of an era there too. Too bad. Too bad, there aren't many Renaissance men left. Um, a lot of people didn't, weren't, weren't aware of his theatrical productions on the Cape, obviously because they, you know, it's a local thing, but it, it does seem like he got a lot, and a lot of satisfaction. I mean, he really kind of dedicated the last 10 years of his life oh, to doing that exclusively. Total enjoyment. Tell me a little bit about, about He didn't care things. if it was a, if it was a total failure or not. He did it. It was being performed. He was happy as a clam. Didn't care. People came. That's great. They didn't come. That's okay. He did it. This is his play, and and uh, he wasn't in it for the financial remuneration. 